What do you think of when you hear the word Transylvania? Probably Count Dracula and vampires in general. But what if I told you that it is much more than that? Transylvania has been a historically highly diverse region, with a big Hungarian and German-speaking population. In this video, we will focus on the history of the German-speaking minority group there, also called the Transylvanian Saxons. Talk about the history and the current situation. The first German-speaking settlements in Transylvania, also called Siebenbürgen in German, were founded in the first half of the 12th century, more than 800 years ago. At this time, people mainly from the area between the Rhine River and the county of Luxembourg moved to the region, after being invited by the Hungarian king Geyser II to do so. The reason behind this was to further colonize this undeveloped, underpopulated region and to secure it against possible invasions from Central Asia, for example from the Comans and the Tatars. Transylvania in the Middle Ages was basically divided between three political entities, as you can see on this map. The first one being the Hungarian nobility, which governed over hundreds of thousands of Romanian, Hungarian and also German farmers. Their sphere of influence was called the Noble Lands, or Komitatsboden in German. The second group were the Schekelis, a Hungarian subgroup that settled in the Schekeli land in the eastern part of Transylvania. The first German settlements were founded in the south of Transylvania, the so-called Royal Lands or Königsboden in German, where they would build their oldest and most important cities. But some settlers would also find a new home in the northeast of the region, along the Bistrita river. The territory colonized by the Germans covered an area of about 30,000 square kilometers, or 10,000 square miles. In the year 1224, the so-called Golden Charter of Transylvanian Saxons was issued by the Hungarian King Andrew II. This charter practically granted the Saxons living in the region political autonomy. It is to this day the most extensive and best elaborated statute ever granted to German settlers in Eastern Europe. Here are the main points of this charter. The Saxons would form a collective political entity and they would be subject to their own laws. The Royal Court of Hungary would only intervene in cases where the citizens cannot come to a solution on their own. The judge and priest in each village and city would be elected directly by the citizens. The merchants would be exempt from paying taxes and customs within the Hungarian realm. All forests, plains and bodies of water within the territory may be used by the settlers without restrictions. But they would also have to pay a yearly tribute of 500 marks of silver and provide soldiers to the Hungarian crown in cases of war. The German population in Transylvania grew rapidly and the settlements prospered. This development would however face its first major setback with the Mongol invasion of 1241, which caused widespread death and destruction in the Kingdom of Hungary. Around 15 to even 50% of Transylvania's population died as a result of the invasion. But the Transylvanian Saxons would eventually recover from this blowback and enter into a phase of cultural and economic prosperity in the 14th century. The Saxon mines at that time were producing valuable goods, among them gold, silver and salt. Trade was flourishing, also because the merchants didn't have to pay taxes on the trades thanks to the Golden Charter. The trade routes would stretch from the Baltic Sea in the north to Constantinople in the south. During this period, many German towns in Transylvania were evolving into cities. Those cities would remain the only urban centers in the whole region up until the 18th century controlling most of the trade and industry. This made the Saxons the most influential and economically important group in Transylvania, despite being the smallest by population. The rise of the Ottoman Empire posed a new threat to Transylvania and its population in the 15th century. The region became the target of several Turkish invasions and raids. To have a better chance of dealing with the invaders, the different ethnic groups in Transylvania formed an alliance, called the Union of Free Nations. Part of this alliance was the German-speaking population, the Hungarian nobility and the Schekelis. They could achieve some important victories against the Ottomans, but the region remained a target of constant Turkish raids. These raids led to the building of the famous fortress churches by the Transylvanian Saxons, seven of which are World Heritage sites today. 
The buildings were reinforced with walls and defensive towers and were meant to provide safety and shelter to the population in case of an invasion or raid. The larger cities were also reinforcing the defensive situation with the building of big city walls. But despite all these efforts, there were still villages, especially the smaller ones, that were vulnerable to the bigger Ottoman raids. It wasn't uncommon at that time that tens of thousands of Transylvanian Saxons were captured and sold into slavery. Those abductions took a huge toll on the still relatively small German-speaking population. This led to several settlements and even districts being completely abandoned, although some of them have been repopulated. The people needed for this were mostly German speakers from the Kingdom of Hungary, but some of them were also Romanians, since there were not enough Germans available to fill the gaps. Some of the vacant farms were also given to the so-called Transylvanian Landler, a group of Protestants from Austria that were exiled from their home country because of their religion and deported to Transylvania. Around 3,600 Landler were deported to the region from 1734 until 1776. In the 16th century, following the Ottoman wars in Europe, a civil war broke out and the Kingdom of Hungary was split into two and later three parts. One of those parts would become the Principality of Transylvania, which existed in this form from 1570 until 1699 and was for most of its time a vassal state of the Ottoman Empire. Luckily for the Saxons, they would keep the rights that were granted to them by the Hungarians 300 years ago. The Ottoman raids, however, would still continue. In 1699, after the victories against the Ottomans, Transylvania became a crown land of the Habsburgs and was now, for the first time, part of a German-speaking empire. Shockingly for the Transylvanian Saxons, roughly 100 years after their incorporation into the Habsburg realm, the Austrian Emperor Joseph II declared that the Golden Charter and its promised rights would no longer be valid. Luckily for them, however, this decision was undone on the Emperor's deathbed. About five decades later, in 1848, the March Revolution reached Transylvania and Hungarian rebels occupied the region, trying to revoke the Saxon autonomy once again. But with the help of the Russian Empire, Austria could defeat those rebels and took back Transylvania in 1849. Following the Austro-Hungarian Compromise of 1867, Transylvania became a part of Hungary again, which meant that their de facto autonomy was now gone for good. The Kingdom of Hungary practiced nationalistic policies, and its objective was the assimilation of the non-Hungarian population inside the realm. The Transylvanian Saxons tried their best to resist these Hungarian efforts, and were partly successful, thanks to their strong social cohesion. Another reason why this relatively small ethnic group could survive for so long were the strict rules and norms. It was for example not acceptable for Transylvanian Saxons to get married to people of a different ethnic or cultural group. If a person did that, they and their children would have been cast out of the community. After the First World War, Transylvania was given to Romania, which was a part of the Antau alliance. At first, the Saxons welcomed this new development and hoped for a better treatment under the Romanians compared to the Hungarian predecessors, but soon their hopes would turn out to be just that. The Romanians continued the nationalistic and anti-minority politics of the Hungarians and even intensified them. Even though they agreed to grant special minority rights that were demanded by the Western powers. In the new Romanian constitution from 1923, no minorities were mentioned, only Romanians. It was also stated that the Romanian Orthodox Church would be the dominant religion in the state, which was seen as another discrimination against the Protestant Transylvanian Saxons. The Romanian government lost a lot of trust among the ethnic Germans within their borders, which led to rising immigration numbers and a decline in birth rates. Another bad thing was the stagnation of the Romanian economy and the slow impoverishment of the masses. This could still be managed by the ethnic German farmers, but the uncertainty still led to discontent. Apart from the increasingly poorer farmers, there existed also a very small but very rich group of Transylvanian Saxon industrialists and bankers that, before the beginning of World War II, controlled around 90% of the industry, 75% of the commerce and all but one bank in Transylvania. Many of those people were also politicians and held majority positions in most German-speaking cities. They were mostly not affected by the worsening economic situation, 
which led to a loss of trust among the population, even though they often tried to better the situation of the ethnic Germans during negotiations in Bucharest. This resulted in political radicalization, and at the regional Saxon People's Council elections in Transylvania in 1935, a National Socialist Party member won a majority of the votes and became president of the council. In 1930, the Romanian government conducted a census, where every citizen also had to state their ethnicity and native language. Back then, a total of 238,416 people stated that they are ethnic Germans. That corresponded to about 8.29% of the total Transylvanian population. They were, however, very unevenly divided across the region. In 1940, a German organization in Romania estimated the number to be around 250,000 at that time. The Second World War brought a lot of changes for the Saxons. The Second Vienna Award in 1940 saw that the northern part of Transylvania would be given to Hungary, so that the Hungarian-speaking Shekeli population could be reunited with them. This also meant that the German-speaking population in the region would be split between two countries for the first time in their existence. Being ethnically German meant that the Transylvanian Saxons were of high interest for the government of Nazi Germany. So they founded the so-called Deutsche Volksgruppe in southern Transylvania, an organization that aimed to Nazify all cultural, political and economic organizations there. Responsible for this process for the ethnic Germans in northern Transylvania, now a part of Hungary, was the organization Volksbund der Deutschen in Ungarn, which was founded in 1938. The German leadership was very interested in recruiting the Transylvanian Saxons and to integrate them into their army. This wasn't easy, however, since Romania, an ally of Germany at that time, and also at war with the Soviet Union, wanted them to fight for their country. Until 1943, Romania even considered ethnic Germans with Romanian citizenship that voluntarily joined the Waffen-SS as deserters. That, however, didn't stop the German government in continuing their efforts to illegally recruit new soldiers in the region. Through a lot of propaganda, the majority of the population, especially the youth, could be convinced that serving in the Waffen-SS or the Wehrmacht was a noble cause, and many were eager to join them. Men that refused to join them were publicly shamed and insulted by the population. Another issue that led many Saxons into the arms of the German army was the bad treatment of minority groups in the Romanian army, which they hoped to avoid by joining the SS. After a meeting between Adolf Hitler and Ian Antonescu in the April of 1942, the Romanian leader agreed to release those ethnic Germans from conscription that would prefer to serve in the Waffen-SS. Roughly a year later, in the May of 1943, the two countries signed an agreement in Bucharest which also legalized forced conscription for the Waffen-SS in Romania. The situation in the northern, now Hungarian part of Transylvania, was very similar to the one in the south. Around 70,000 Saxons lived in that part of the region in 1940. Around 95% of the Transylvanian Saxon men that were able to serve did so during World War II, and almost all of them became soldiers in the Waffen-SS. At least 2,000 of them were also guards in concentration or extermination camps like Auschwitz. As the front line advanced towards Transylvania in 1944, the German army ordered the ethnic Germans there to prepare for an evacuation to Austria and Germany. They could only enforce those measures in northern Transylvania though, because the southern part of it was located in Romania, which switched sides in 1944 and was now an ally of the Soviet Union. Around 35,000 Saxons would be evacuated during that year, and less than a hundred died during the process. Their fate was however still better than that of their brothers and sisters in the south. There, around 30,000 people were deported into the Soviet Union for forced labor in 1945, with over 3,000 deaths as a result. According to the Romanian population census in 1948, the German population in Transylvania shrank to around 158,000 people after the war. The Saxons that remained in Transylvania were dispossessed and discriminated. All private means of production, as well as the two biggest Saxon banks, were nationalized, and all remaining German newspapers were banned. All those measures led to a rising will to emigrate out of Romania within the German communities there. This emigration process wouldn't be easy, however, since Romania didn't allow them to go. 
at least not without financial conversation. This led to negotiations between representatives of West Germany and Romania, the first contacts being made in 1954. Back then, Romania demanded to receive at least 1000 US dollars per person. The two states established official diplomatic relations in 1967, also because of the immigration problem. In 1968, the Federal Republic of Germany appointed Heinz Günther Hüsch, a lawyer, as the leading negotiator in this case. He started the negotiations in February of 1968. The basic idea was that the Romanian side would commit to let a certain number of ethnic Germans go in a certain time frame. The German side would commit to pay a certain amount of money for each emigrant. It came to big disagreements between Bonn and Bucharest regarding the classification of certain people. Since Romania wanted to receive more money for specialists and skilled workers, and Germany wanted to pay the same amount for every person. In April of 1968, Romania demanded the following payments for the three different categories of emigrants. 1,700 German marks for category A, 5,000 German marks for category B, and 10,000 German marks for category C. At that time, four German marks were worth roughly one US dollar. The German government agreed to these figures, and in March of 1969, they signed a temporary contract with Romania for one year. After that year, they signed another contract, and continued this cooperation until 1989. As the years went on, the prices for the different categories were also rising, and in 1983, the categories were abolished altogether, and the same price was paid for each migrant, 7,800 German marks. Six years later, the prices for the last Germans before the collapse of the communist regime in Romania have risen to 8,950 German marks. Historians estimate that, from 1968 until 1989, more than 1 billion German marks were paid for the roughly 225,000 German emigrants. Not all of them were from the Transylvania region though. In addition to that, it was also common for the emigrants to pay bribes to local authorities in Romania, or otherwise they wouldn't get the papers required to leave the country. The total amount of bribes paid is estimated to be around 225 million German marks in the 1980s alone. But the Romanians also received additional non-financial compensations. For example, German luxury cars or hunting rifles for the collection of dictator Ceausescu. At the end of 1989, the new Romanian government lifted the travel restrictions, which led to an exodus of the remaining German-speaking population in Transylvania which was around 150,000 people at that time. In only two years, more than 90,000 Saxons left the country, and in 2002, only around 80,000 Transylvanian Saxons were left in Romania. It wasn't easy finding reliable data about the population development, and some sources even contradict each other. I could however create a graph showing the decline of the Transylvanian Saxon population from 1900 until 2002. The numbers come from estimates and Romanian population censuses, and seem to be pretty accurate. Bigger Saxon communities outside of Romania also exist in Germany, Austria, Canada and the US. Over 95% of the Saxon population left the country, in which they lived for over 800 years, and today, only around 13,000 are left in Transylvania. The most famous out of these 13,000 is without a doubt Klaus Johannes the current president of Romania. He describes himself as an ethnic German with Romanian citizenship. The population as a whole is, with an average age of around 60 years, very old. And the few young people that remain can't find a Saxon partner in their age group anymore, which means that they probably can't sustain the population much longer. That means that, in a few years, if no miracle happens, the centuries-long story of the Transylvanian Saxons in Romania will come to an end. That's it for today's video, thank you for watching and see you next time.